Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our, our webinar series. Um, uh, good afternoon if you're from South Africa and if you're joining us from anywhere else in the world. Good morning and good evening to you. My name is uh, Professor Muniba Isaacs, and I will be your host in South Africa. We also call this a uh, program director, but I prefer it to, um, to be called um, host of, of this program. Our topic is on um, rural uh, women and climate justice. And um, just a reminder to everyone who are Xing or tweeting. Um, the hashtag is uh, rural women and also hashtag, um, hashtag climate uh, change. So um, we will, um, I'd like to introduce you to our, our dean, uh, Professor Michelle Iso, and um, she will just um, welcome all of you before uh, we have a really exciting program lined up to you. Over to you, Professor um, Iso. Thank you, Professor Isaacs. Uh, good afternoon and a warm virtual welcome to our co-chairpersons of this webinar our panelists and attendees. This is the faculty's fourth and final webinar for the month of August. As we conclude our webinar series, I think it's important to once again remind ourselves of the reasons behind these webinars. We remember the courageous and resilient women of 1956 who militated against the oppressive past laws, who were not afraid to let their voices be heard on issues relating to social justice or injustice in that context. In our first webinar, you may remember me referring to the plight of women in our country, women who are more disadvantaged than their male counterparts in the micro enterprise and small business sector, women who are forced through circumstances to single handedly provide for their families and extended families women who are denied opportunities simply because they are women. Today's webinar focuses on the plight of the rural woman. In all respects, the rural woman is more vulnerable and marginalized because one, she's a woman, and two, because of where she is located. The realities of climate change over and above the effects of inequality poverty, unemployment, and geographic location make the life of women in the rural parts of our country even harder. This webinar is being hosted at such an appropriate time. While the focus is on the effects of climate change on women in rural parts of our country, this is an issue much like the coronavirus pandemic that is ultimately affecting us all. I was listening to CNN last night, and whether it's Chile in South America with extreme rainfall, or Texas with its sweltering heat, or Cape Town with arguably one of the coldest winters ever, climate change is affecting the world over. However, as with any global phenomenon, the poorest and most vulnerable amongst us are the most affected. I'm grateful to our two professors, Professor Isaacs and Professor Hall, for embracing work of impact in the way that they have. The approach really speaks to the scholarship of engagement for societal impact. Moreover, I'd like to thank them for their contribution to the development of a future cohort of experts in this field. I look forward to the presentations of our postgraduate students and I encourage you to actively engage in the deliberations of this afternoon. Thank you, Program Director. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. Uh, thank you for situating our webinar in, um, in, in the kind of plight and the crisis that we're in. It's just not, it's just not climate change. It's, it's, it's a crisis that, that we in and all of us need to think about it and see what, what we can do. 
beyond uh, recycling uh, of plastic. So um, it is a pleasure for me to ask my colleague, uh, Professor Ruth All, as you always do, to make sense of what is this climate change that we're talking about and why are we talking about uh, climate justice. Uh, over to you, Ruth. Thank you so much, uh, Muniba. Uh, thank you, Dean, uh, for the opportunity. It's great to be part of the series. We are doing something quite ambitious here, which is uh, provoking a conversation within the faculty um, in which we are all learning about climate change and how to integrate these issues into our teaching, our learning, uh, and our research scholarship. Um, in 2020, the United Nations Secretary General uh, made a speech on the pandemic of inequality. And at that time, in the context of COVID, he talked about the fact that we are in stormy seas. And he said, the most important thing about COVID and understanding a crisis is to understand that it exposes falsehoods. Um, and in that case, it exposed the falsehood and the idea that we are all in this together, that we are all in the same boat. He said, we are on stormy seas, but some of us are on super yachts while others are holding to the debris uh, on the water. So in that sense, um, thinking about uh, a crisis like COVID helps us also to shine a light on how crises like climate crisis that we are living through are articulating with existing forms of inequality. Now, um, our uh, aim in this, in this session today is to feature several of our up and coming uh, research associates, PhD and MPhil students who are doing field-based research around the country. And what's powerful here, I think, is that none of them set out explicitly to study climate change, but all of them are finding both climate impacts and responses on the ground. Now, when we think about um, climate change, we are, um, I think, quite agreed across South African society, not in all parts of the world, that climate change is a result of human activity, that it involves both extremes of heat and cold, of drought and flood, and also unseasonal uh, temperature, rainfall, and other weather patterns, including winds. And as we see on the eastern coast of South Africa and East Africa, cyclones and other extreme weather events. Now, climate is not about weather, and it's not about the normal variability of weather, but about shifting patterns of weather over time. Um, all of these have profound impacts. So not only do we need to think about climate change, but about the ways in which they affect, it affects different people across different parts of society. Now, what we have um, done in, this, in the preparation for today's conversation is to work with a group of, of of students and young researchers to discuss how they are observing climate change in particular sites. Now, South Africa is, of course, both a big emitter of fossil fuels, uh, by far the biggest in Africa. It is also a site of many of uh, the climate uh, impacts. So recently, in fact, last year, class released a report summarizing the available literature on the impacts of climate change on rural livelihoods in Southern Africa. And in that we observed that while um, this region is a hotspot for climate shock and biodiversity change, in fact, it is not, uh, it's a bit of a blind spot when it comes to policy responses. The one area in which there has been a shift in recent years is towards renewable fuels, green hydrogen, solar, wind, fracking, um, and natural gas exploration, both on land and in the sea. However, all of this comes with a politics because it has it takes place in, in sites where often rural people are living. So our focus here is looking at direct climate impact and how it affects rural populations, uh, but also how the mitigation policies themselves also often have significant impacts in rural communities. So. Our, our focus here also builds on a big conference that we held as UWC co-hosting with uh, three other institutions last year, where we looked at climate change and agrarian change. And there, one of the focus issues was about how, while the generalized effects of climate change are felt around the world, but experienced unequally, so too 
A lot of the costs of transition are pushed onto rural communities because it requires land, it requires territory, uh, and many of these interventions, whether it is red plus and carbon offsetting deals, whether it is conservation and the enclosure of land to protect biodiversity, um, whether it is um, the expansion of renewable fuel crops. Those are three ways in which mitigation policies are actually driving forms of dispossession of rural communities. Many of these phenomena are seen around Southern Africa and beyond, and they compound the, the direct climate shock that people experience. Now, our view is that we need to think about the climate change issue, therefore, also as a climate justice issue. In 2020, a coalition of civil society and social movements in South Africa launched the Climate Justice Charter, which sets out a definition of climate justice, which extends beyond thinking of climate change to say the principle that those who contribute the least to the, to the emissions that cause climate change should not be carrying the costs, either of climate change or of the cost of mitigation. So this is the lens through which we move into the conversation today. Uh, we hope very much that this will ins inspire a lot of further thinking about how we can mainstream climate issues across our faculty, using our different disciplines to contribute to knowledge from the social and economic sciences, um, and also ensure that the voices of grassroots organizations, grassroots communities and women are brought to bear in the debates beyond. So we hope to inspire and to provoke ourselves and one another as we take it forward. Thanks so much. Over to you, Munita. Uh, thank you very much, Ruth, um, uh, for the context and why we are doing this. So um, it, uh, I have a, I will share our, um, our presentation. And as we go through um, our presentation that I make sure that it is on full screen and that it I am at the okay. So our our question here, <clears throat> our first question is um is basically where we ask uh how do rural women cope uh with the increasing droughts, heat, um floods? and um, even sea level rises? Uh, and how do they ensure food for their families and uh, continue uh, with their livelihoods? So we have our uh, research associates um, that uh, will start off. And our first uh, colleague, I'm not going to introduce them, they will introduce themselves and their, uh, um, where they are located uh, and, and where they work. Uh, so each one will have five minutes to uh, speak on the, on, the, on the topic. And <clears throat> let, us, uh, let me introduce Sepesekle uh, Mbele and he will uh, give us his presentation. And yeah, you can see a collage of photos of the work that you are doing. And I must say, it makes me proud when my colleagues like Ruth and others are talking about fish and not me. Please go ahead, Sipe uh, Sikhle. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sipe Sikhle and I am a, a research associate at PLUS and I'm based in Guanibela, a community in northern Guazul Natal in Shushuwe. Uh, today, I'm going to be speaking to you guys on the climate change impacts on small scale fishes in the community of Guanibela, but also women. So as I said, this, uh, this community is in the northern KZN, and uh, I'm not sure if this is working, but here, uh, if you can see, it's in like a peninsula shape and opposite of the community, is a marine protected area, uh, which is Isin Mangaliso Wetland Park. So it is surrounded by a lake. This lake is called Kwanibela Lake. It is a huge source of livelihood for the entire community, and it's considered a fishing community, uh, with uh, almost every family having access to fish in one way or the other. So between 2003 and 2008, a devastating drought hits this particular community 
which led to the drying of the lake, uh, the N Nibela Lake, which you see in the picture right here. Community members share that you could literally walk to the other side of the lake and that's how dry it was. Obviously, because of the reliability of the community on, the, on this lake for livelihood, uh, uh, fishing as a source of livelihood, this caused a, a huge impact. So this led to huge, uh, a huge move or migration of families um, to other communities, nearby communities, fishing communities, to be able to have access to that source of livelihood, but also land that they can work to be able to uh, sustain themselves. And in most instances, you'd find that male members of the family were the ones who were going to migrate. So sons and uh, uh, um, husbands would, mi would migrate to these communities. And in some instances as well, urban areas with the intention of sending back some money home to, to the women who are left behind to take care of the family. But as time went, you find that uh, the money wasn't coming home, wasn't coming home. And women on top of their social reproductive roles of taking care of their families were then forced to be able to look into what can we do to be able to respond to not only the fact that we are not receiving money from our sons and husbands who are gone, but to the climate change, that do, to, to the changing in the weather pattern and the drought that is happening in the community. So um, uh, in the picture on my bottom right is Mrs. Gena. Um, she is one of the first fisher women in the Guanibela community and one of the few now because there's only four. So she shares that during this time, she uh, even, it has an impact on cattle. She had like 15 and she, it was her responsibility to herd the, the, the cattle and had to walk for a, a distance of her, over 10 kilometers in order to reach a place that has water for the cattle to be able to drink. And she shares that in some instances, they'd have to buy water from uh, you know, their neighbors and share water amongst themselves as well. And um, she carries on to say, this is a picture that was taken last week recently to say that um, because of the drought and the rare uh, rain not coming, rainfall not, not being as much as it was before, this has had an impact even the crop, in the crop growing that she's doing. So there are pests that come out of the ground that impact her harvest season after season. This also saw um, currently a huge uh, influx of women um, harvesting the resource called ingema, which is the grass that they use uh, to make mats and then sell them on, on the sides of the road. Because this resource was available in uh, homesteads and community landscapes, it was easy access community members could use it, um, harvest it and sell it. But because it, it, it because it also grows on wetlands and places that have, you know, a, a good amount of rainfall. But since the droughts, the women have been forced to be able to want to gain access to the um, uh, Isimangalisto Wetland Park, which is a protected area with restrictions on access and regulations on who enters and when. So further putting themselves vulnerable to law enforcement officers and the violence and being beaten up, but also vulnerable to wildlife and risking their safety to be able to provide for their families. So all in all, this is to just say that there's a huge dependency um, on uh, natural resources and nature in the Wanibela community, and that women are at the forefront of the imp impact and the brunt, uh, suffers the most brunt in um, the climate change crisis, particularly in the uh, community of Wanibela. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sipa Sekhle. You were uh, definitely on time. I am now calling uh, our next presenter, Ayanda Mdala, that would um, also go to the south of um, KwaZulu Natal. And it's so exciting that our UWC researchers are working across the country. Ayanda, over to you. Thank you so much, Muniba. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ayanda Mazala. I am an associate researcher at PLUS and currently based on the south of Ismangaliso Wetland Park, working with communities around the question of conservation. Uh, today, my focus is gonna be on conservation in relation to rural women's livelihood, as well as uh, the climate injustices. Just to give a brief of, of uh, the 
the of Ismangali Wetland Park. It is a conservation area where people were forcefully removed and had to experience land dispossession and displacement uh, because all in the name of conservation. Um, in that, I'm going to make an example of what uh, I, I see as structural as well as special injustices that occurred during this dispossession and displacement. I'm using a case of Umama Umlungwana, who was, <clears throat> was a resident of Bangazi, which is circled in black on the map here, but was uh, moved to Kula village where I'm also doing my research. So when she was moved uh, prior to the movement, uh, the, she mentions that uh, she was able to use natural resources in the sense of grazing for her cattle, uh, crop production, as well as fishing. When she was moved into the area, there were some special injustices around the limitations of having to continue keeping the cattle. She could no longer keep the cattle because the space in which she was moved to did not provide for gra the grazing area. Um, in that, uh, fast forward to the floods that took place in KZN. As you can see on my, uh, on my screen here, there is a house, an, an indication of a house that's soaked in water. Here is, is one of the examples of the houses of wh or what you see in Kula village today, where people were moved and now Umamum Lungwana, she can't, uh, she can't use the area that she was moved to because it's soaked in water. She used to plant uh, for subsistence farming. She's unable to do that uh, at the moment because uh, there's no area where she can use the, the, the land. She can't sell the place because nobody would want to be placed in a in a in a in a soaked house and she can't move also because because she doesn't have the means to move uh, so going back to the question that we were we are asked now of how how do women cope mine would be women are not coping at the moment especially in the area where they have been moved looking back at the research that was done by plus uh, on food systems around covid it was one of the finding findings showed that most households who have subsistence gardens are at a better chance of survival uh, compared to those who don't have gardens uh, looking at that and uh, and and comparing it with the current situation of Umamum Lungwan, you can clearly see that if we were faced with the crisis of COVID-19 and it were to hit us again, and including uh, what climate change is doing in the area in terms of floods, you can clearly see that rural women in this area will find it very difficult to continue uh, to live uh, and to sustain their livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ayanda. Um, I will then uh, swiftly move over to another living landscape area that we are working in, and that is um, of Mapungukwe. And I will ask Maud Sebelebele to introduce the, her work, herself and her site, and also respond to the question. Um, thank you, over to you, Maud. Um, thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. <clears throat> As Prof introduced me, my name is Maud Sibilivili and I'm a research associate with PLUS. And I am situated at Mapunguwe, well, rather in the Mapunguwe cultural landscapes. And my research site is Denstad Farm. Now, Denstad Farm is a restituted farm that was given back to the Machete and the Simatla community in 2020. So the community is relatively um, new in the area. Prior to that, it was a commercial farm and um, due to the structure of the commercial farm, it means that the community right now still live in those um, commercial farm stands where you either have one room, two room, and they still share the same um, sanitation areas, which means that they share the same community toilets. Now, um, what is unique about Denstad is that it is 
um, situated in between commercial farms, commercial farms that are arable and plant um, your tree, your um, your avocados, um, and so forth. Densat is also um, seated right by the banks of the Limpopo River, adjacent to Botswana, and right next to it is Mapungube National Park, which is also part of the Transfrontier Park. So. Um, as you can see in the um in the picture below, uh, the last picture on the bottom um on the bottom left shows uh, the barrier between the park and Denstad in itself. Now the community is also ninety one kilometers away from Musina, which is the nearest town, and again thirty five kilometers away from the tar road. So um in the recent years, then that has experienced some um traumas when it comes to uh climate change. I mean climate change effects. Like for instance, in 2013, then that experienced, or rather the landscape experienced a flood. So what happens is that the area bowl land that they once had, um, the community said it was washed off by um a specific type of sand, and now it has become um, unerable to plant at. Um, moreover, um, the community here still works on the local farms, so they live from hand to mouth. So um, it means uh, when devastating things like the flood that, that happened where people had to be airlifted out of the community, a lot of their livestock died and a lot of their subsistence also um, was washed away. Um, the current floods are also happening. For instance, in um, earlier on the year in February, there was a warning that there will flood in the area, which raised a lot of insecurities. Another issue is that Denstad has also experienced some drought in the area. And because it's part of a transfrontier park, you find that animals moved from other countries like Botswana and Zimbabwe, and they moved into the space where the community now live. So. Um, the stresses that also affect the animals also affect the community. Um, the women are the ones that are holding the family in the forefront because just like Ayanda um, has explained, um, families uh, within the marginalized space, um, they have a lot of family, I mean, the women experience a lot of family responsibility. So to ask the question, do the families cope um, or rather do women cope in such instances? Well, there is a battering system between the women. That is what I observed. For instance, there are some that fish and share fish with the communities, and those that um, have um, animals are able to negotiate. However, to say that the uh, are the community coping, I would say no, not in these instances, especially now with the increase of wildlife moving within their spaces. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maud, for your insights and um, also making that link to to what's happening in um, Isimangaliso as similar challenges in Mapungukwe when it comes to women coping. And I think it is also important to kind of highlight that we always think that women need to cope or they cope with their daily lives. It looks like they're coping and they're not. This is clearly what um, what the studies um, are showing. So we are moving uh, uh, swiftly to the next uh, presenter, and that is Ashley Bishop. She, Ashley um, will be working on, and sharing her experiences with her work on a rural women in this Stellenbosch informal settlement. Uh, thank you, Ashley, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Professor Muniba. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ashley Fishoff. Um, I am a master's student at PLAS. Um, and as mentioned, my research looks at the lives of women living in two urban land occupations in Stellenbosch, in Kanini and Azania. So the question I'm sure everyone is thinking is, well, what makes these women rural in an urban setting? So these women are rural in that um, the vast majority of them come are migrant workers coming from um, the rural Eastern Cape. You can see on the map there, it's kind of indicated 
Um, these women are rural in that even though they are in an urban setting, they um, are still very much tied to the rural household in terms of responsibilities, usually in the form of remittances. Um, and although being in a urban setting, um, in Stellenbosch, this is very much a farm-based agrarian uh, landscape. So to, ex to talk to the question that we were asked, I'm going to introduce you to a woman named Ndinani. She is originally from Willowvale in the Eastern Cape, where she lives with her mother, her younger sister, and at the time, her only child. Uh, she's now living in Nkanini in um, Stellenbosch, um, with her second child. So her story really shows how one person can simultaneously experience two climate shocks that would traditionally be understood as being polar opposites. Ndinani, at the same time, has deal with the consequences of a drought in the Eastern Cape and flooding um, in Stellenbosch. So in 2008, uh, Ndinani migrated from the Eastern Cape um, she spoke about the difficulties um, of feeding her family there because she could no longer grow food for subsistence because of the drought. Um, she left her child with her mother um, while she migrated to Stellenbosch in search of work, where she did get work as a seasonal farm worker on a commercial wine farm. Um, she speaks about the difficulties of the continued droughts in that um, she's required to send more money back to the Eastern Cape in order to ensure um, that the whole household is fed. In um, Stellenbosch, she also practices her own subsistence agriculture um, to feed herself and her child um, with the incredibly high costs of living. Um, she grows spinach, tomatoes and um, butternuts. Um, so the um, settlement of Enkanini is along the Easter of Fear, um, and you can see in the map on the far right hand side that um, a large part of uh, the settlement is on a floodplain. Um, in July this year, there were devastating um, floods in Stellenbosch, worse um, than usual. And this caused um, the banks of the Eterofia to burst. Um, Ndinani lost um, all of the crops that she had been growing. Um, and she also expressed um, severe anxiety um, and concern that her employment as a seasonal farm worker was going to be um, negatively impacted in the coming season um, as some of the vines were destroyed um, by these recent floods. Um, so when when looking at how women are coping and what are what are the gendered consequences of this, um, we've seen um, in, in Dinani's story that the reproductive um, work and the reproductive burden still falls on the shoulders of women. Um, what does tend to happen is that this um, burden is shifted more to older women, so along lines of generation. Um, but still remains um, the sole responsibility um, of women in order to cope. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Ashley, for your insights as to, you know, how rural women migrate to urban areas for work. And then when they get to urban areas, they they face, um, you know, also challenges that that are related to to climate um, change uh, issues. Um, I'm going to move to our next speaker. He is a PhD student of Professor Ruth Hall, and so too um, Ashley is a master student of Professor uh, Ruth Hall. Ndu uh, Majosi will um, present his work on Ekanana commune in Devon. Ndu, over to you. Um, thanks, thanks, Moniwa. Um, greetings, everybody. Um, my name is Ndu Majosi. I am a PhD student at UWC under the College of Economic Management Sciences, CIPLAS. Um, I'm also dealing, um, doing my PhD in Devon. 
at the occupied area named Ekenana by Abasali Basem Jondolo. This site was occupied in two, two, 2018, uh, illegally so, uh, so without any negotiating with the, the, the government. So in my case, um, most of the occupiers, uh, why is this um, relevant here? Uh, most of the occupiers are from the rural areas, mostly from KZN and other parts of the Eastern Cape. Um, and also in terms of identity, they also uh, sustain their livelihood using farmings. Um, and also they are common linked, just, like, just like Ashley, um, in terms of uh, back home to the rural. So my zooming in, um, I can zoom into one case of the person, the occupier that I interviewed for uh, my PhD, Baba Zilekumete. She is one of the rural migrants who migrated to an urban area in search of great economic opportunities, which are non-existent. She is the mother of two and uh, would also depend on her. So um, in face of such crisis, uh, she is um, relying on farming as the uh, primary source of her livelihood and that of her children. So the challenge here uh, since 2018 is that since um, the occupation is developing, there has been a, some kind of a climate crisis that has been facing the whole country. Um, one of which has been identified in form of flooding both last year and early this year, uh, whereby close to 450 people died, uh, 40,000 were left homeless. Um, so, and this also affect um, Ekenana in a sense that um, the, the, their farm that they are using to sustain themselves uh, has also been um, uh, damaged. Um, in, in terms of one, be it an extreme heat, uh, and secondly, in form of uh, heavy rainfall that are damaging the vegetables. Um, and also, in order to supplement this kind of livelihood, um, I observed that they have started something back uh, in 2021 um, in form of a, a poultry farming. So they are farming chicken. It was started back using 30 chicken and one occupy, uh, one in, o, occupator, I hope I'm saying it right, occupator is for hatching um, chicks uh, from eggs into chickens. Um, yes, but due to the power cuts that become exacerbated during winter, there has been a lot, a lot of stock losses. And also due to flooding, which also penetrate the chicken house, um, there has been a, a loss also. Um, also, um, she notified and related this to um, the type of material that they are using um, to build the chicken house because they cannot afford a more concrete and um, expensive material. So they use um, material like corrugated iron, wood, and, and et cetera, which is easily penetrate, penetrated by rains uh, or flooding. Um, and also there was another campaign that uh, they started, the cleanup campaign to remove solid waste uh, uh, within the river bank that is cutting across the area. Um, in order to get the, 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 the occupation ready in case of any flooding event, because they identify this to be amongst the risk factors whereby um, the waste that is within the river is being pushed back uh, into their home in any event of flooding. Um, and also, lastly, um, I may also state, um, as uh, maybe you can see within my case, that um, this is uh, a case of a, that primarily deals with uh, spatial justice and spatial struggle. So there is sort of an underlying factor of spatial vulnerability, whereby uh, people that are there in Ekenana, they are one of the urban uh, migrants who are also allocated a space that is uh, quite, a, can be seen as a risky areas that is next to the river banks. And also that is lacking um, resources in terms of basic services, drainage systems, uh, urban infrastructures like your roads are non-existent. Uh, also housing is non-existent, which make them greatly prone to climate crisis. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, Ndu. Um, I'm going to move to our last presenter, and that is, um, um, that is Star Yeni. She's doing a PhD in um, uh, under the guidance of uh, Professor Ruth Hall. Star, over to you. Introduce your, your study and uh, what you're presenting. Um, Star, I am unable to hear you. Can you hear me now? Indeed, yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks, Muniva, and good afternoon, everyone. What I'm going to present here is is not my PhD research, but it's my other research uh, in my activism capacity, which I did with a colleague, uh, Asan Benya. So we were looking at, uh, we were wanting to capture the lived experiences of, of people who live around the mines, particularly women in, in ways that they were affected by coal mining. And we, we did a study in Somkele, which is in the north of Kozulu Natal, where Tendele is mining coal, which is arguably one of the biggest coal mines in, in South Africa today. Um, so I'm going to just jump straight to our key findings, and I'm going to highlight um, at least two things. One, um, I'll talk about the, the impact of coal mining on land-based livelihoods and how these affect women. And the second point, I'm going to health-related uh, impacts, and again, how these play out. Uh, for women's responsibilities on their day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So on land-based livelihoods, one one of the things that the mine has really done was to take away all the water resources for the community, all the water streams, rivers, dams. It's all now used by the mine to wash it and clean coal, which means people don't really have access to clean water. What the mine has done is to put uh, water tanks where there's a car that comes, a truck that comes every week to fill up the tanks and people can just walk in and get the water from the tanks. But it's all very dirty because it's covered with uh, with with coal dust. You can see in the picture there, we open the tap just to test the water. You can see it's just black. And this is what the what people are supposed to drink and 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 and, and cook with and bath with. Secondly, the because of of the coal uh, crops are dried up and it, they're all covered in dust. So people are no longer able to, to produce crops. Fruit trees that they are dying. Most households, they have fruit trees such as mango trees, banana trees, uh, avocado trees. Um, I forgot the other, the, other, the, 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 the other fruit. But most households have those trees, so which meant people would have access to fruits throughout the year, but not anymore. Uh, crops are dying people have just been discouraged to 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 plant anymore um so grazing land has been taken by the mine whatever is left off for people to graze on is covered in coal animals are dying i have a picture there of a, of, of a goat which died on the day we were there they were just waiting to take it to the cops so they can open it uh, because they want to claim back for for, for from the land for competition which again is another Another story for another day, but these are just examples of so, how how land based levels have been affected. My apologies yes. to interfere, but uh, do you mind switching your camera yeah. off? Uh, it is a little bit um, your internet okay. is a little bit uh, tricky, so we just want to you be able. Okay. Hear you. Thank. You. Yeah. All right. Can I continue now? Uh, please do. Sure. Um, yeah, and, and you can see in the other picture that how close the mine, the houses are to the mine. So the proximity is quite close, which means whatever happens to the mine is felt directly in, 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 in the community. Um, when the mine blasts coal, the dust just of the houses it covers, it covers everything. Um, and what that means then for, for, for women's labor is that they have to clean the houses repeatedly. The, the women we spoke to told us that sometimes they have to clean the house three times a day. 
they have to do laundry sometimes twice. If you forgot to bring in your, your washing and then the mining plus coal, you come back home, all your washing, all your laundry is, is, is covered in dust, it's black. We have to rewash it. So that's more labor for, for women, uh, but it also means more money spent on washing powder and soap, which the mine does not account for. The mine does not pay for all these costs which women have to have to take care of. Um, the second aspect of, of our findings look at um, the health implications. So when the when the whole area is covered with dust, with dust, this is what people have to breathe uh, every day. The women we spoke to told us that their their children are coughing, they are sneezing, their eyes are itchy, they are red. I mean, we saw these children ourselves. They've got sinuses, asthma, all of this since the mine came in 2006. Um, and that means also the daily work to take care of the sick kids uh, rest with, with women. They have to take the kids to the clinic more regularly, to the doctor more regularly. They have to spend more money paying for taxi fare to go to the doctor, sometimes to go to the doctor in town where they have to pay cash for. All of this does not come from the mine. The mine doesn't cover these costs. These costs have to be, have to be carried by by this household, and women have to do all this labor. Um, so it's it's costing financially, but also also emotionally. Kids have to miss school because they are sick most of the time, and the mind the mind does not take any responsibility for this. So these are just two I mean key findings that we we find which really which speak directly to uh, how this affects women and and, and their roles. Um, in 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 the household, but also their 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 livelihoods. Moniba, let me stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, it is um, in in um, it's good good timing to stop there. Um, I I want us to. I just want to thank all of you. I'm going to stop sharing um, my screen and just want uh, all of you who presented to put on your camera and uh, join the session. Um, so this is the first half of the session. Uh, the problem. Can I switch my camera? also on. The problem is that, you know, we're having so much fun and we want to kind of really see what 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 the, they're presenting. And, um, uh, I, I, and, and I think it is important that we just pause and for a moment to to see um, if there are any questions that uh, people are posing. And I see there are some in the question and answer and also some questions that are posed um, in the chat. So um, the, first, the first question is, um, it is a, um, it's from uh, Melissa Fouri. And Melissa, it would be nice, um, uh, Melody, I don't know if she could pose a question um to get her voice so that we have a little bit more in interaction um, um melody uh would she be able to um ask a question Papa, i will just um try to add it to panelists one moment please okay uh, melissa yeah, furry. and melissa furry and also maybe our uh, director andres de Toit. i didn't ask him to ask a question but uh, <laughs> uh in all. melissa please um, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please oh, go excellent. ahead. Thank you. And thank you so much for this really interesting webinar. I really, really appreciate this. Um, I am a member of the Presidential Climate Commission. So that's why you see my question there about, uh, about restorative procedural and distributive justice. Um, I, you know, obviously, uh, you know, as commissioners advising the government on these issues, we and obviously, this is not just about women; it's about uh, the transition generally. Um, we we are looking for for very practical ways, you know, practical ways to to give effect to those concepts of justice. And so, very interested to hear what what people who are kind of observing all these impacts on the ground how how are you thinking about this? What what can we do better? Um, you know, these are obviously very complex challenges and, you know, it's, 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 the impacts are huge. The, there's a lot of costs involved in all of this, but obviously we, you know, as, and I'm a civil society commissioner, so I'm particularly concerned 
about justice and about social gender justice, et cetera. And so I'm very keen to hear thoughts about how we can do that. I mean, restorative justice, looking backwards at the burden women have already carried and climate impacts in terms of fossil fuels um, and then distributive justice. And I was very interested in Professor Hall's comment at the beginning about how women or rural areas are particularly impacted by kind of new, the new value chain for renewable energy. Um, so yeah, I just, just kind of wanting to push a little further on the kind of uh, forward looking aspect, you know, what we can do better. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Melissa, that, that is, um, and thank you for joining um, our, our session. Um, I'm gonna ask Ruth, to 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 maybe take a first stab to uh, that question, and if there are any one of the panelists that want to kind of chip in, because I have to say that we haven't looked at the the issue of climate justice, but we find a lot of injustices. So thinking about the pathways is also something that we will deal in the second half of this session, if we can move on swiftly to kind of deal with some of the ideas that are coming out of the some of the injustices and what we've been thinking about, you know, looking at livelihoods, but find something else and how to include that. Ruth, if you just want to kind of briefly just try to kind of do that, and we could come back to the question, I think, in the when after our, our next session. Thank you. And it's so nice that somebody from the Presidential Commission is here and listening. Firstly, listen, I think that you raised three dimensions, restorative, procedural, and distributive. On the restorative side, I think that a lot of the context that we do research in is where there has been um, very limited restorative justice already. In other words, restorative justice for res restoration for colonial and apartheid uh, dispossession. The one case where there has been is Mords, where there's been uh, uh, restitution. So I think that in many ways, the need for uh, restorative justice um, arises from the fact that in many of these cases, there hasn't been restorative justice for past injustices, and now we have climate shock compounding that. Uh, so in many respects, we have the policies there, but very little implementation. On the procedural stuff, I think that one of the things that's emerged from many of these studies it's just that rural women's experiences, lived experiences, are not documented. The fact that people struggle in these ways is not directly linked to climate debates. They're not really involved. Their voices are not being heard. There are some exceptions. There's the Rural, rural Women's Assembly. Um, there's the Climate Justice Charter Movement uh, and others where some of the rural groups are involved. But by and large, there's a silence. Um, and so there's a danger, I suppose, for us as academics to be sitting here and talking on behalf of people. Uh, and what's powerful for me is if you look at these cases, the six that have been presented, none of these were in, in uh, designed as climate studies. However, with these ex established relationships, what could be done is, uh, is further work to engage with the communities around how they respond and what for them would be uh, climate justice. So I actually think there's an agenda for new work to be done. But let's hear from the others. Back to you, Thanks. Um, uh, thank you, Ruth. Um, also, your audio is not particularly clear if you could try and sort that out. I know earlier your camera was not working, but now it's your audio. Um, uh, um, Andres, you also have a question. Uh, yes, I was happy just to type it into the Q and I box. So I'm a little bit um, shocked at being promoted to panelist. But mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much to to Maud and Star Sipasleti uh, Duduzo Ashley for your case studies. They were very powerful and moving. Uh, so case studies of how women are impacted by uh, by climate injustice and by just some of the ordinary injustice as well and inequality. Mm -hmm. But but what I really want to know is uh, what is your view as researchers, as young researchers, of what contribution research can make to the picture? And particularly, how do you see your job as bringing new ways of seeing new forms of analysis that might open up new possibilities for action, new strategies? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that. Um, any, Not any one of you in particular, but any of you feel, feel moved to answer. Thank you. And can you please okay. take me off the panel now? I want to uh, go okay. back into the, the non No, we'll, we'll dump you. No, no, Andres. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, 
anyone would want to try to answer that question? No pressure. Do yes, your... yes. Um, please, thanks, please thanks, do. Andrew. Yes, um, maybe in short, um, what is our contribution as researchers in this debate? Um, in short, my one contribution and worry is that we should also always avoid narrative grabbing. Um, narrative grabbing, grabbing in a form of trying to professionalize and academify this debate. It should always, we should always try and simplify it rather than vigorize it. Um, that is one factor. Thanks. Um, anybody else want to chip in um, into into how are you part of uh, the change and also some of the analytical tools that you are are using and contributing to? If I can go. Um, sure, Sebastian. Go for it. Yes. Thank you. I think that um, in addition to Ndu's contribution is that ensuring that the knowledge and the voices that we're gathering from the ground just doesn't stay in literature, but ourselves as researchers, including in the way that we collect our data, be actively involved in organizing in responses and even active advocacy amongst the communities that we work in and with. So collecting those nuances, but also having channels, proper channels as researchers and scholars to be able to ensure that they have effective change. Thank you. Contribution. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Andres. I, I also feel that it is about the methodology. And although um, they are describing cases and um, and, and limits um, uh, to, to what what one can do on this particular platform. It is also important to note that uh, we have three or four research associates that um, are part of the local communities that are living in the communities that speak the language, that understand the culture, and um, that are posing uh, questions around, um, you know, what are the what are the livelihood issues, but also what is their relationship to to land and and um, and the environment and access, and therein um, they are also working on a number of concepts. And uh, social reproduction is one of the concepts that they are are dancing with for now. And they are looking at to what extent some of these can they can contribute to to that, but also to see um, the one of the main issues is the issue of access. You know, access is a big issue for to natural resources to to um, the work of the of the the research associates. Um, Star, I'm going to give you a final chance to give a stab at Andre's question. And thank you for the question, um, Andres. Yeah, thanks, Muneva. I'll keep my video off because I see my network is not good. Um, so just to add to, to, to the question, I think what also is important is that to raise is that some of us are not just researchers at universities. We are very much embedded in, in these struggles. We are part of we are part of these movements in one way or the other. You know, we've worked with civil society. We are still part of, of those spaces where such this kind of debates um, have a big role to play, you know, where we can influence uh, campaigns, advocacy work, working with activists. Um, yeah, so it's, 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 it's also about how do we think about research outside of, of the university? Uh, where, where else do we? engage with this research, which is actually important for, for, for advocacy work, you know? So that's also another uh, area where you, you find us. Thank you. And, and that feeds into what the Dean spoke at the beginning, you know, the scholarship of engagement and, and our, are also contributing to that directly or indirectly. So I'm gonna shift gear a bit and um, 
and and speak to um, the concept of uh, just transition. And just transition has been um, used a lot in the climate uh, change and um, and climate uh, justice debates. And what what does that um, actually mean? And uh, I've been looking around at what are the definitions of a just transition, and a lot of the there are two elements um, around it: is this movement to a, a low carbon um, and a, a climate resilient economy, uh, and the other one is that uh, no one should be left behind. So they in are, uh, you know, a lot said. South Africa on the continent and Nigeria are the two middle income countries, but they are, are hugely dependent on fossil fuels um, to, 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 to basically keep the economy going. So it, it's, it's oil and it is, um, it is coal and star. Uh, presented the impacts on livelihoods, the water, the agriculture, and also animals when it comes to when it comes to to coal. Uh, but South Africa, uh, coal-fired power stations are still a big part of our economy, and South Africa is one of the biggest emitters on the on the continent. That is that is that is clear south africa can uh, i think a lot of the kind of social movements speak about the global north and uh, the global south when we're speaking around movements but when we're talking about climate change south africa cannot be part of the global south that that they are playing a minor role in terms of uh, being an emitter we are one of the biggest emitters on the on the continent and for that reason, climate um, change is important that we transition to a uh, low car carbon, um, uh, a resilient economy. But my question to Stach is that um, when we're moving towards a, a low carbon economy, which makes sense and your argument makes sense, but my my um uh, what I want to ask you is that what about the communities, the small scale um, uh, people, the artisanal people who are working on coal, that are making subsistence um, and livelihoods from coal? In um, Pumalanga, there are about um, 60,000 people that are dependent on coal for jobs and 200 and plus thousand people in the value chain that are part of the coal value chain. Taking that and moving to green uh, climate resilient economy, I can tell you that they are not necessarily going to be part of that uh, new jobs, new skills that is needed. So we're talking about the just transition. And I think the question also during the chat was, you know, how do we, how do we, what, how do we unpack justice um, and in different forms that, that we, we unpack justice. Um, for me, it's what happens to those who depend on a livelihood. What would be your comment on that stuff? Um, okay, thanks, thanks, Moniba. And I think that is a valid question. It's, it's one of the questions that comes up a lot, even when you 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 read debates on, on on social media, on Twitter. That's what often people ask. So, what about the jobs? And I think um, the question itself it necessitates that we maybe we unpack a little bit. The nature of these jobs uh, in, in 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 coal mining as a starting point, right? And then we see where, what what answers we arrive at. And I, and I would look at this with I, I think there are two two ways one can can unpack the nature of these jobs. One we can talk about the employment itself. Uh, I mean employment trends in 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 coal, which 
have dropped over the years. Um, coal is no longer employing as, as many people as before. It has become capital intensive, mechanized, digitized, and, and many other things. I mean, studies are showing that it's not uh, a, a biggest employer a, a, at all anymore. But secondly, uh, I mean, if I, if, I, if I make example of Tendele Mine, where we did our research in, in Somkele, it, it, it employs at least less than 20% uh, of people permanently. The rest of the labor force are casual workers in contracts. And those who are employed permanently are mostly people in management in what we call white collar jobs, mm. you know, the accountants, mm. the CEOs. Mm. And those are not people from Somkele. Those are people who come in the morning and drive out to, to Rivers Bay or, or, or those nice suburbs in the afternoon. The people from the, the black people, the black workers, particularly men who are the ones who have to touch coal every day, those are mm. employed at, um, uh, it's casual work, it's, they, they've talked about challenges with, with unions, the wage are so low, uh, there are no benefits at all, uh, work, work benefits, the wages are so low, they cannot, Take care of 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 themselves, of their of, of of their families, right? Especially in the context where people's land based livelihood have been destroyed mm -hmm. by the very same coal mining. So on the one hand, coal mining is providing jobs, right? Precarious jobs. On the other hand, it's taking away every other option, right? So the only option people are left with is this these precarious jobs and how many people can realistically be be, be employed uh, in a mine if we are being realistic with the, the 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 people we spoke to they were saying they were taking one person per household and mm -hmm. not all household uh, uh sent members to to not not every household has someone employed in the mine so now one household member has to take care of, of 12 other members with this precarious salary no more grazing, no more other land-based livelihoods. It's just a disaster. And on top of that, people are getting sick. And that's just one of the, uh, another problems with, with these jobs in, in, in mining. The second part I wanted to bring, people are getting jobs. We interviewed former workers who are in their forties. They have stopped working. They are in their forties, far from retirement age. They cannot work anymore because they are chest the lungs mm. are destroyed completely. They, some of them showed us their, their uh, um, uh, health set, um, reports from the doctors to say, sorry, young man, it's over for you. So, I mean, but, but, but if we say, so these are jobs, we really need to employ, are these jobs really, really lifting uh, families and communities out of economic deprivation? My answer is no. They are not. They are doing the opposite. Um, so really, we need to interrogate this question of jobs because it's often used to to, to silence mm -hmm. people. No, bring violence, bring jobs. Therefore, mm -hmm. how can we say it's a job? And of course, in a, in a society like ours where there's so much poverty and employment, when you say there's going to be a job, of course people will say yes. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the costs of these jobs, when, when young men in their 40s can no longer work anymore, uh, now that then we have a crisis. Where is the, I mean, because of course climate climate justice is not just the question of justice. It is a question of social justice in its totality. And if and to maybe to now come back to your question, mm. what's going to happen to these jobs? Uh, if we look at proposals that 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 activists who've been thinking about this question for a while, uh, what comes to mind? So so of, of, like the, if you think about the climate justice movement, which 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 produced the climate justice charter a few years ago, which spells out what what this transition would mean. I mean they are proposing. Um, it's not just it's just just transitioning to 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 green energy uh, through solar uh, uh, wind, which they're proposing it should be community based, socially socially controlled, uh, because otherwise you don't want again to have corporate control coming in and then the locals don't have a voice. But also what they are highlighting there is that people, women in particular, will have to have a say. So it, it, it's about having those democratic processes in how we're going to, to, um, to, to, to create a renewable energy. And of course, create uh, employment opportunities in the process. That's what Thank the you. proposals Thank are. Thank you, Stav. 
Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, I, I think that um, you've made your point and I think that uh, I don't disagree with you in terms of the importance of, uh, you know, that uh, the impacts of coal on people's health, uh, livelihoods and the, the nature of the jobs. I think that that there's another aspect of this just transition that is problematic and worrisome to me, and that is the financing. Who's financing that? And that is something that we can maybe come back later um, if we have time. And I'm worried about time. I I want to I want to ask other uh, researchers on the platform. Uh, to what extent to have you are you seeing any collective forms of movements um, amongst rural women that are happening to defend either their resources or, or, or issues that are happening at, at local level. Um, maybe I could ask um, Ayanda, do you have um, any inputs on that? What's happening in your case? Uh, thanks, Muniba. Um, in relation to your question, I have a, 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 an example of when last year uh, communities went out to protest uh, uh, wanting to go back to, uh, to their land. This is straight after they were hit by the floods. So whenever something major uh, like floods and, uh, and seems unbearable for them, that's when they feel the need to go back and protest for the land that they were uh, moved from. So that's that's one example that that comes to mind. Thank you. Is there anyone else that want to chip in to see what are the other examples that are happening in, in your area and your community that you are working in and with? Sipasekhle, I see you're unmuted. Yes, um, sorry, it's completely dark and load shedding, but um, yeah. You see that in the case of Wanibela, uh, you find that women are collectively organizing themselves because of the need to access these resources. So they organize themselves to access these protected areas with restrictions or not, with violent law enforcement officers or not, but go inside to camp overnight and harvest these resources. But also you see them um, collectively involving themselves in broader um, you know, advocacy initiatives with communities around issues of fisheries and fisheries rights in these communities. So they organize, they, in, they form part of the broader conversations as well as protest move, uh, movements um, in uh, injustices or on access to natural resources in their community. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much, Sipisekhle. Any Anyone else that want to chip in um, from, from your work that you can see that there are already some form of, um, of mobilization um, uh, uh, movements that are happening at local level? If not, then um, I'm going to kind of switch gear and let's go back to the the questions and and um, answers that uh, that I see on the screen. And I see there are um, a little bit more more questions that are asked. Um, uh, and uh, this is just a comment. Um, uh, of Emile. Um, sorry, my light is in my eyes, so I can't particularly see see the question that is posted. Um, also, uh, a comment from our former colleague, that uh, uh, Kathleho. Uh, welcome, Kathleho, and good that you are joining us. Uh, on online, um, and uh. There's also some comments in the the chat. So I am wondering if um, uh, so there's also asking for contact details. So uh, uh, it means that some of the work that you are doing can immediately go in 
to to some of the ideas that are um uh, that are, are happening in terms of the the climate the presidential climate um commission so surely we will we will be grateful to share the the context of of our researchers um as we said earlier we didn't go in to look at climate justice that was not the intention of this the intention of this um was to see how does your work in in the communities how how do people um uh how does climate change impact them do you have stories of extreme weather patterns conditions and how do women generally cope and this is what we came out with uh i um i think it is uh if there's anyone that want to kind of i think it is important if they wanted to come out and and ask a question that would be nice And I wonder if uh, we've answered uh, your question partly, uh, Melissa, um, with the last bit of intervention. Um, uh, Kathlejo, can you come and ask your question, Kathlejo? Um, if they can make you... Uh... And yes, um... Please, um, Emile, can you can you pose your question and then I will hand over to Kathlejo. I see your hand is up. Thank you. Um, are you able to hear me? Yes, I am. I'm good. Uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, so, like I indicated in the question and answer box, my engagement is directed towards Ndududu concerning that. I'll just read from the question box concerning that very powerful presentation that touches on spatial justice and the situation of Abatlali in Kenana. Now, my, um, let me rather introduce myself as well. I'm currently a master's candidate at the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria, and I'm just at the beginning stages of my research. And I'd like to look into um, climate-induced migration, particularly in urban areas. So the question that I'd like to pose is, maybe is there anything you can tell us about how the research um, that he is particularly working on can contribute to the relationship between Abatlali and provincial and even municipal uh, level uh, governance in the area in terms of the development of climate resilient strategies that are being developed because as far as I'm aware, I know the Tegoni municipality has been making efforts to you know, create some climate resilient strategies. If you take into consideration the recent, I'll say, conference they had on developing those involving various stakeholders. Now, if you think of uh, Abatlali, um, we're aware that they're not necessarily the most welcome figures in formal governance. So I'd just like to know if is there any kind of engagement that we see going on um, between the municipality and the residents of informal, so-called informal areas like Abatlali to ensure that as they develop these climate strategies, climate resilience strategies, um, all pe all persons are represented. It's not a top-down approach, rather horizontal and collaborative okay. to ensure the thanks, ordinary person thanks, actually... Thanks for your question. I, I'd like to give him a quick opportunity to kind of um, just respond. Sorry to cut you short. I'm just mindful of the time. Um, my apologies. Do, do you want to respond? Please? Yes. Um. Yeah. That. 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 You see, the, the question might even take even longer since. Um. Yeah. But um. Abasali, one of the things that they have been engaging in is is quite like building democracy from below. Um. In every community that they work with, be it in Tembisa, be it in other parts of uh, in other provinces like in Pumalanga. Uh, what I've been, uh, I've been noticing is that there is sort of a building of structure uh, of governance from the occupied site and the informal segments that they are uh, covering, uh, which engage directly with the government. And they're also being um, teaching uh, their activists to participate in local government processes like your IDP, etc. Yeah, but yeah. It's, I can see the time is coming close, but yeah, um, um, I mean, you can read some of the work that I, I normally post up in op-eds and such. You can also go to the PLUS website uh, blog. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. Please visit our PLUS uh, website uh, for more information. 
as um, Ndu has directed to you. Kaflejo, um, would be lovely to see you. Please pose your question. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Muniba. Unfortunately, I can't switch on my camera. Um, okay, I'm getting a message. Okay, let me just say yes. Um, I think that Kaflejo, are you are you taking a message or are you taking a call? Um, okay, we'll will any other one uh, any other questions? Um, I'm checking on the uh the chat uh, the production of um. Okay, sorry. Um, I think the screen did something. I'm here. Okay. Make sure. Yeah. So basically, I was I wanted to ask um three um questions, and uh one is I wanted to understand whether um the researchers in all the sites that they've worked in, um, are there any support solutions for women and their families? Um, my other question was that, um from their own observations i mean i think all presenters helped us understand the impacts of climate change on rural women but from their own observations what do they think is needed to help uh, rural women lead the change and um when they engaged with the participants the research participants did they understand all these changes around them um that it, it's it's climate change um, how do how 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 do uh, they articulate it? How do they understand whether all these changes are due to to climate change? Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Katlejo. Um, are there any one of you that want to respond to Katlejo? Um, Ashley. Um, I think I'll come in just to respond very quickly because I think Katlejo's question touches on some of the difficulty I had in answering question two mm -hmm. in that, um, yes, women are engaged in collective action, very much so, but this isn't under the banner of climate change. This is more under broader um, struggles and politics of inequality and poverty. So mm -hmm. I think it really, and the discussions that, we had as a group it also really re-emphasized that climate justice fits within broader social justice um, and can't be separated um so thank you Katlejo, for that question um Maud, uh, do you want to come in in terms of where you have used to go back to your um to your transcripts to see what people have said to you um do you want to talk a bit about that in response well, um, I'm going to also um, echo Ashley in the sense that um, it's not reflected that it's climate change. However, these struggles, um, you do hear women that know um, that when it rains more, this becomes difficult or that becomes difficult. But then um, also to, I mean, link it to more social justice, it's all about your, your spatial inequality, you know, why they put us here, mm -hmm. why are we living here in the first mm -hmm. place, you know? And also the fact that um, when the Transfrontier Park was considered, it was considered for the animals in themselves, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the livelihoods of the community. So these sharks, um, they, they, they are represented when they talk. Um, it's just that they don't say it's climate change. And also when they work for survival, they don't say I'm working because the climate is changing or so on. It's just that these are difficult times. And with the other injustices that we face, um, this is where we are at. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maud. I think that Tapiwa, you have a question. Um, you have your hand up. How are you, Tapiwa? You can unmute, good, and maybe yes. Um, unmute, please. Hi, Maniba. Hello. Oh, yeah. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Hi, everybody. Um, my question is sort of um directed to Mode and um, um, 
I wanted to know more about the the, the context which is she is working in. Uh, what type of farming systems? Uh, because to me, it's one case which sort of represent uh, land restitution uh, projects, and uh, we've been just we're just busy doing one project on land uh, on land reform and how it helps people in coping with climate change, in particular livestock. Uh, from my little understanding of Mapungugwe, I thought maybe it was a livestock area. And my question to Maud is how is uh, sort of uh, land reform or land restitution helping people or farmers that side to cope with uh, the the effects of or the, the of climate change? Um, and to me, it sounds like the mosaic of land and different types of uh, of of um, uh, land tenure systems, and in our work, what we realize that sometimes people sort of because in livestock settings, mobility is key, and it's not always being as uh, sort of supported by government and. Um, what do you call it, uh, and other state institutions, uh, particularly in the with the proximity of the uh, transform, uh, what you call it, uh, uh, the national park, one would think that it will definitely uh, lead to uh, curtailment of uh, the curtailment of um, the curtailing of livestock movement. So I'm just wondering how, what kind of farming systems are emerging, and what how people are sort of coping. Uh, in that kind of scenarios. I don't know if it's clear enough. It is quite clear. So um, the land was restituted to um, a CPA. So even though it's, uh, the CPA is one family, but there are many families in between. And yes, the majority of the community work as um, farm laborers. So the type of uh, system that you find is that everybody has one or two or three cattle, right? Um, and indeed, um, I have communicated with the Department of Agriculture and they can support with like your resources, like your, um, what do you call your, your feed in the time of drought. But um, the fact that it's next to a transfrontier park, it makes it quite difficult, as you have noted, because now the animals, the wild animals, they move around, which means that the community only has a little space. Uh, that they left in order to practice um, the subsistence farming. So they can't necessarily keep a lot of cattle because that would require them moving further in, of which they also question um, their safety as well. So to answer your question, it is still just quite as complex for um, the land restitution and the Department of Agriculture, especially in the sense that um, that area is dedicated to be a cultural a heritage site, you know. So farming in itself, you it's it's because it's quite complex even for the um for the commercial farmers in themselves. So in my community, it's communal farming. There are commercial farms who are also just affected by the fact that it's next to a restituted um I mean it's next to um a park. I don't know if I'm answering or your question or if I'm clear on it. If yeah. you if you don't if you don't answer your question, um Tapewa knows that you are um colleagues at, at the same institution and they could know more about that. Uh, thank you very much, Tapewa. And um he's also our, our PhD student who has submitted his um his PhD. So so congratulations on on that, uh Tapewa. Um uh, hopefully we will have good uh, celebrations at the end of the year. Colleagues, uh, thank you for all your inputs. And um, and I think that, you know, we uh, expectation was at the time a one and a half hour is maybe too long. It's actually too short. Um, Ruth, do you want to kind of bring it back? to uh to the faculty and um and and really just you know bring home to to where where we are based and what we need to do as um as researchers and why we need to continue the work that we're continuing thank you um over to you Ruth Two minutes then. Uh, let's let's finish. There are some powerful things that have emerged here around loss of um, use of land, around livelihoods, around people being pushed into illegality, taking new risks, uh, the importance of the commons, the centrality of migration, 
um, a conflict within communities and growing demands and conflict in state society relations. So all of these are important issues for social scientists. We're wondering now whether this is not uh, a good moment for us within the faculty to have a conversation across our disciplines to say, how is the faculty going to mainstream and integrate climate change and climate justice issues into our work, into our curricula, into our postgraduate training, into postgrad theses, into our own research agendas. Um, and our view is that it's not good enough anymore to have some people specializing in climate change. We probably all need to upskill mm. ourselves. So we think that maybe there could be some overarching questions. And, you know, there are also fields within our faculty that are specialized in working at grassroots level, but we need to work at different scales. And there are those who are well placed to look at the politics of climate financing. Where is that going? Because we can understand some of the grassroots issues, but together we need to, uh, to put these elements together. So in our view, this fits nicely within our niche areas around entrepreneurship, around citizenship and democracy, around land, uh, and that it could be uh, a more integrated uh, conversation within the faculty. So we hope that this uh, session has, has provoked some of those thoughts and that we can pick them up. Thanks, Monifa. Uh, and thank you to very everyone. Much. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ruth. Thank you, all the panelists. Thanks for those who are sticking it out. I know it's a time where there's a lot of family responsibilities and that you are here till the end. Um, it's definitely a topic that we have to mainstream within our work, within our research, within the faculty, within our curriculum. Um, and I think we are best placed to do that, uh, to, to kind of make sure that we do have a, a just transition. We also we also going into 30 years of our democracy next year. And what have we done? I think these are our debates and issues that we need to kind of take further and pick up. Dean, I wonder if you just want to, to just close the session for us, please. Ochi, oh, you're insisting that I do it, eh? Because we spoke this mm -hmm. <laughs> earlier on. But I, I, I think, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Isaacs. I think this was a wonderful um, webinar series. And if I just reflect on the on the four webinars, uh, this is the first time I think that we've had such a diverse series, but also just to, to benefit from um, listening to the work of the postgraduate students and the research um, assistants. And as you've said, uh, Ruth and Muniba, definitely an opportunity for us to talk more seriously about how we mainstream this work. And I can definitely see there's a place, I mean, as I was listening to, you know, some of the stories around the, the women who had lost their crops, um, it made me think about our entrepreneurship niche, but Professor Hall, as you, as you mentioned, um, there's also that uh, interconnection with our niche on citizenship and democracy. So definitely opportunities to bring our th three niches together because land and agrarian studies is also one of one of those uh, four, four areas. So thank you to, to our panelists, to our coaches, and then to our, uh, our wonderful audience. And uh, we should next time, I think we should uh, we should have some kind of prize for the attendees who Melody, who um, who attend all of our webinars, I've seen a number of familiar names mm -hmm. who have been journeying from the first webinar right to the last one. Thank you, everyone, and do enjoy the rest of your evening. Goodbye. Bye bye.